Hello friends, I am Omnisai here for another episode of the Omnisai Tabletop Role-Playing Game Preservation Society. Today we are going to be looking at a relic from the past, but one that I consider to be essential for the enjoyment of a particular game. Uh, its importance was eventually obviated by the vast amount of material that came afterward, but if you were going into this game when it was shiny and new back in 1986, this book would become an indispensable part of your gaming library if you enjoyed this particular game. The game? Star Wars, the role-playing game from West End Games, of course. But today, the product that we're going to look at was the Star Wars source book. Now, the source book be was so essential because in the core rule book, it is a solid hardcover, but it's not excessively thick. There have certainly been much bigger role-playing game manuals than this. And you consider how much artwork is packed into here, clips from the movie, you're going to have to leave out a bunch of details. And some of those details are the kind of thing that game masters are really going to want to be able to bring into their game to make it feel alive and vibrant and explain some of the different questions players are bound to have. Enter the source book. This works to bridge the gap between what the book has, which is primarily about how to run characters, how to... Uh, you know, create a character, how to get through the mechanics of, of gameplay, and instead add on all those things to make it more Star Wars. Adding on vehicles, adding on ships, describing how ships work, and our understanding, space is scary because it can kill you very quickly. Yet, characters from Star Wars fling themselves into space all the time without a second thought. What is the thing that makes space less scary for these people? That's in this book. And uh, information on the alien races, that is not included in that book. Eventually, later guides, the, the, the core books cover a lot more of the racial things because they weren't based on a template where if you were one race or another, it was just another aspect of the core character. In this case, you could look at what is among calamari? How are they different? What are their physiological differences? More so than just the thumbnail sketch you'd get from the template. Also, this gives us a snapshot of the characters from the movie, so you kind of have an idea about how you stack up against Han Solo, Darth Vader, Boba Fett. Those are in here. Now, I have to uh, admit, this book has been damaged and has been for a very long time. The last few pages in it are torn out, which is truly unfortunate. Not all that critical for what we're going to be discussing, but uh, they are missing a few of the character statistics in the game, especially for the villains, which, again, it's unfortunate, but I looked and I couldn't find it anywhere in the collection. So I'm suspecting that those were missing a while ago, but that will not deter us from reviewing this book and looking over all the crucial points for it. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to an old friend of mine, the Star Wars source book. All right, this is the Star Wars source book. And again, I would like to credit the, uh, the person who's letting me use this right now, my good friend Vince, um, who has graciously allowed me to borrow his uh, collection. So, uh, the book is, of course, a hardcover. This one has seen a, a lot of use, so it's definitely a play copy. Uh, opens up, as all great Star Wars books do, with the opening scrawl. Uh, and this basically frames your position. This is the Rebellion era. This was the first trilogy, so it's really a game that's about fighting against the evil empire. So everything in it is, is done basically from that slant. You're playing rebels against the, the greatest enemy in cinema history, if you're a fan of the Star Wars movies. So, the first thing is the introduction. For those who aren't as savvy in the Star Wars galaxy, this is what kind of brings you into what Star Wars is all about and how to use this book to your advantage. Clearly, most people are going to be assumed to know a thing or two about Star Wars, but at this point, the deeper lore outside of a few books was 
fairly limited. You only knew what you really saw in the movies, and this was going to prepare you for knowing a lot of the ins and outs of the movie, some of which they were creating and releasing from this game for the first time. The first chapter is about general spacecraft systems, and again, this explains some of the things that the movies take for granted. Hyperdrive, and what is it, and how does that enable a galactic empire or republic to have existed? Without hyperdrive, your your universe is very limited to just what is in range of as, fa as fast as your engines can get you there. Hyperspace allows you to cheat and go between systems or even go from one end of the galaxy to the other in the much less than the span of a person's life. Although it may still take a, a great deal of time, especially if the, there isn't a clear path to do so. Uh, explaining sublight drives and how ships can fly, this helps a game master to, number one, uh, use less techno babble. There is techno babble built into this, so if you want to say, hey, your ion drives are leaking, and you know, you, you could explain that in a way that makes it sound like you're not just making up saying like the engines are losing fluid or something like that resorting to what you know from earth in this case it broadens your your lexicon and helps you to understand um, what star wars tech is a bit more like armament and shields what's the difference between the different weapons you will find them in the core rule book but this it's going to be explained a little bit more and the paper, rock, scissors of turbo lasers, ion cannons, uh, laser cannons in starships. Turbo lasers are big, powerful, requiring you know huge roomfuls of fire control and power generation, and they're the primary weapons that are used against other capital ships. Laser cannons are smaller, quicker, and better apt for uh, fighting off starfighters that are coming. They can, however, in a pinch, be used against other large capital ships. Ion cannons slice through shields and shut down systems. They don't actually damage the ships. They cause the ships to stop working so well and eventually may shut them down if you continue to bombard with ion cannons. The greatest advantage is that they can get by starship shielding. They go right through it. And that is why, for instance, in The Empire Strikes Back, the planetary ion cannon that the rebels used were able to even knock out powerful star destroyers with uh, a couple of well-placed shots. Went right through the shields, hit the ship, and shut them down to give the uh, fleeing craft a chance to escape. That's all explained here. Proton and concussion weapons, your torpedoes, how do they work and why? Tractor beams. It's all goofy science fiction. We don't know of forces that can do this, that can be generated by a single craft, where you can uh, make something that's almost a mockery of gravity and move things around. But they're here, and they kind of explain how they work, how shields work, both deflector shields that deflect uh, physical objects, as well as ray shielding that can block uh, incoming beams. Sensors, how do they work, and, and what can they detect, what can't they detect, how different ranges matter, uh, different types of sensors, and of course the ways to defeat them for things like cloaking devices and stuff. That is, that's referenced in, of course, uh, The Empire Strikes Back, a ship that small can't have a cloaking device. They do exist, they're fiddly, but they are there, and that would be the countermeasures. Life support. How do you live on a ship for any length of time? Well, you have things that can recycle your atmosphere. You have things that can recycle, you know, personal wastes so that uh, you are not constantly taking massive hits on your, your recyclables. So uh, that's all included in life support as well as, you know, raw food stuffs to keep yourself sustained. Uh, escape equipment. Ejection seats from starfighters and escape pods from larger craft. What can they do? They don't really need to have a lot of stats, it's just enough to know that they're there and how they work. Starfighters. Now this gives you a selection of different ships that are available in the Star Wars universe, as well as statistics for them, which is something that was very, very sparse in the core book, but it is essential if you're going to be having uh, you know, space battles and things. You want some selection. So you have one of the oldest starfighters in the Star Wars trilogy era, the Z-95 Headhunter Starfighter. 
Uh, you have, of course, the mo one of the most modern, the B-Wing Starfighter, designed by the Mon Calamari. The Y-Wing, a rugged uh, ship that was around in the Clone Wars era. The X-Wing, space superiority fighter, which, of course, uh, is so essential in the Battle of Yavin. And this, again, they continue on with their great way of bringing this into the Star Wars universe. These are technical specs for the Incom X-Wing. This might have been the kind of thing that Incom would have floated to various people before the Rebels eventually convinced them to uh, sell them to the Rebellion. And that was uh, two pages front and back dedicated to talking about this ship. How does this help you? Well, number one, you can show this to your players, which is an awesome little relic from the game world coming into your own hands. And secondly, again, with all of these different parts, you as a game master can say, well, clearly your centrifugal debris extractor is clogged. That's going to be a problem for you. Or your uh, sensor jammer. This thing has a sensor jammer. So uh, if you would employ your sensor jammer, which is called a screamer. Uh, the X-Wing has that default. Or maybe they buy a secondhand one and you can look for the parts that might not be available so that you, know, you can understand a little bit more about how these things work. The TIE Starfighter, which is something that few people actually want to be in. This is a nice little performance data chart so you can compare and contrast the different, uh, different vessels. But again, you have uh, TIE Fighter models. There's lots of different kinds. There's the basic TIE Fighter. And an Imperial uh, pilot, uh, your, your standard Imperial pilot for a TIE fighter. Uh, the TIE interceptor. The TIE bomber. The interceptors are pretty nasty. The TIE bombers are brutal against the right thing. And look, we have an Imperial Star Destroyer and their typical TIE fighter complement. All out laid here. These are the kind of things you can expect to deal with if you have a Star Destroyer in the system. So yes, you would know that they have one, two, three, four, five, four. They have three flights of 12 TIE Fighters. So yeah, they can bring 36 standard TIE Fighters to bear if it's at full, full equipage. They have 12 Recon TIE Fighters, uh, 12 Interceptors, and 12 Bombers. That is the standard outlay. And each of those 12 flights are going to be broken down into four, three squadrons of four, each of which are going to be broken up into two-man uh, fighting pairs. Elements, they call them. Or the, the terminology. 12 is a squadron, uh, the four uh, ship flights, and then the two elements in each flight. Got to use the terminology, right? Because if you're going to be talking with Imperials, they'll know their terminology and use it. This is another way of keeping your people in the game the bomber, nasty because it has, uh, you know, it's got laser cans, but those concussion missiles can be absolutely deadly, and they can be equipped with other weaponry, too. Combat starships. Now we're getting into the larger ships. We're going into the Corellian Corvette, like you saw in the opening of the uh, New Hope, with uh, Princess Leia trying to escape from that Star Destroyer. That didn't work out so well. Spoiler alert. Uh, escort frigates kind of vessels that you can expect to uh, see. This would the, be the uh, Nebula and B frigate. Uh, this is most notable probably in the movies as the medical cruiser that Light Luke ends up in at the end of The Empire Strikes Back when he's getting fitted for a new hand. Often they aren't the biggest ships and they don't have the most guns, but they often fulfill a support role or have a secondary task, like a medical one that holds... Uh, a mobile hospital where you can take care of uh, wounded uh, rebel troops and personnel. Then you have Victory Class Destroyers. These are older uh, ships from the era of the Clone Wars. These are eventually were spilled over from the uh, Old Republic uh, Star Destroyers. Uh, they are not as cool as the huge Imperial Star Destroyers that you see again in the opening of A New Hope chasing after the Princess. Uh, the Imperial Star Destroyers are much bigger, much more powerful, more guns, more shields, uh, absolutely devastating. But, since the Empire still has some of these victories, you may still encounter them on things like, you know, blockades and uh, occasionally even a couple of Victory Class Star Destroyers may be expected to contain an entire system. So, you'll still see them from time to time. But if you see an Imperial Star Destroyer, you could be in a lot of trouble. 
the Mon Calamari Star Cruisers. Originally, these were resort luxury ships that have been accommodated for war. And because the Mon Calamari are very much into redundancies, they have incredible amounts of shielding, decent amounts of weaponry, and eventually can start going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the bigger Imperial craft. Note that there's not, still not a huge selection. This world gets added to as you go, but with these, you can at least enter in the conversation and start talking about these, some of these huge vessels. Then you have space transports, and now you're talking about things that the... These are nice for a backdrop, the, the big space cruiser, the big uh, capital ships. Space transports, though, are the lifeblood of commerce in the galaxy. And it doesn't hurt that one of the foremost ships in Star Wars, the Millennium Falcon, is a transport. It's not a starfighter. So you have a stock light freighter, and this is an example of the YT-1300, which is what the Millennium Falcon uh, derived from, and then get, gets heavily modified. This is oftentimes what a starting smuggler will get, a stock starlight freighter, and then they can be encouraged to tinker with it and add things to it. A space barge is not really suitable for... Uh, players to have, but uh, they may end up on one or make use of one to get from point A to point B. And nicely enough, they have a long block of description in the Millennium Falcon, which kind of shows you how these ships can be customized, including, again, more of the specs of it and all of the statistics where you can see exactly how far they differentiate from the original Stocklight Freighter. Uh, along the way, also, there are a lot of nice little personal uh, bits uh, in, in character, in universe, which, again, help to break up this from seeming like a manual adds entertainment value, and, again, helps the game master to come up with kind of people that are going to be in this universe, this big shared universe the players are going to be romping through. Then you have bulk freighters, which you hear people, you know, there are mentions of bulk freighters in the movies, and basically these are the huge cargo transports that go from system to system to, uh, you know, uh, carry foodstuffs and uh, your, your more core products to various places. These aren't going to be used to smuggle as much. These are generally going to be used for legitimate transportation purposes to keep planets supplied and uh, will be used both by civilian and military purposes. They can be modified, but it's rare when you're going to have a bulk freighter that you're going to want to take into a combat. You have container ships that basically exist just to uh, be moved around by other things. They can barely move themselves. Um, and again, they're just huge storage containers moving from point A to point B. You have passenger liners, which are something that players might be able to book or eventually perhaps even own. Uh, for instance, Lando Calrissian has a very nice luxury yacht himself, which can in a pinch, uh, be used to smuggle and uh, a little bit of fighting. So these are good baselines that you can use to uh, continue to uh, tell the story. Cost of passage, if your party wants to get from one place to another and they don't have their own ship, this is the cost, and that's useful to know. Uh, rebel transports, which you see uh, coming off of uh, Hoth, transporting the important personnel off the planet. Uh, several of them get blown up, but here are the statistics for it and how they are used. Uh, actually, not much for the statistics, but definitely, again, more how they are used. Uh, then droids. Droids are such a big part of Star Wars. Not only do you have the main characters like uh, astromech droids and protocol droids, but you also have the medical droids, probe droids, cleaning droids, assassin droids. There's a wide variety, and this shows you the default on how they might come out of the factory, but then when you compare them to the actual characters, like R2 is so much more than just a stack astromet droid that uh, it's, it's nearly night and day and shows you how these characters can grow, how they, what their potentials can be uh, as they uh, are either played or as you, as a game master, might have them as serious NPCs in your game. Um, the assassin droids are, again, something that uh, you can use as enemies that you don't have to really feel terrible about blowing up. Uh, and they're certainly used... This is, again, before the prequels, so you don't even have the uh, battle droids from the Separatists. Um, but certainly they would fit under these rules quite nicely. Repulsor lift vehicles like Luke's speeder or the, uh, the air speeders on Hoth, uh, those all fit. You also have... Uh, cloud cars, sail barges, all of these things which plug in needs in the universe 
so that you can use all of these different toys when you tell your stories. Speeder bikes, those are, those are always a fun one to have. Swoops, more of the civilian version of a speeder bike, usually much less safe. Uh, Imperial ground assault vehicles, because of course you see them in the movies and you may want to uh, play around with ATSTs, the chicken walkers, as I believe the, uh, the uh, old toys used to call them, but also the AT-ATs, the all-terrain attack transports, the, the huge walkers from uh, Hoth <clears throat> that we see. And of course they're used all over the galaxy, so again, they're something the players might have to end up dealing with, uh, or possibly steal and use for themselves. Now we go into Aliens, and this again gives us a little slice of the aliens that were seen in the movies. From Ewoks, Gamorians, Ithorians, Jawas, uh, Quarren, who you really don't see much in the movie, but uh, they are kind of essential to understanding more of the Mon Calamari, so their story kind of plays out alongside of them. Uh, you have the Tusken Raiders, the Sand People, uh, Celestians, and like... Uh, the co-pilot along with Lando Calrissian in the, uh, the Return of the Jedi when he's making the run at the Death Star. Uh, Twi'lex. I've heard them pronounced Twi'lex. I prefer Twi'lex, but I don't know that there's a right or wrong on that. And obviously in a huge universe you would have uh, different localizations for that name probably as well. So, uh, Wookiees, of course. Everybody loves Chewbacca. And then you have the creatures. Not all of the aliens are going to be sentient and possibly ones that you would talk to or barter with or play as possibly. There's also a whole host of aliens that you see that are beasts, creatures, uh, that either exist as a tool, for example, banthas, which are used for moving around, but you also uh, get the idea they're also a food animal, bantha burgers being quite popular in my group. Uh, Dewbacks that you do see in Imperial uh, Astride in the opening of A New Hope. Minox, who you see while the Millennium Falcon is birthed inside of the huge space worm. Uh, the Rancor, which kind of sets the upper limit. Not necessarily that it is the upper limit, but it's certainly one of the nastiest creatures in the game with uh, natural claws and teeth that can end a player character quite easily. Strength of 10 dice, for, for example. A Wookiee has 5. So Wookiees aren't going to be able to wrestle with Rancors very easily. Not unless they get incredibly lucky and the Rancor is incredibly unlucky. And there's a nice little story in here about how uh, a Rancor ends up getting to Tatooine, the one that uh, Jabba takes as a pet. <clears throat> Which also, by the way, is it, the, those those intro stories, again, it breaks up the manual, makes it seem a little less burdensome to read, but also gives you interesting background and insight into different characters in the story. Might even propose an idea for an adventure. Uh, for example, if you somehow uh, slip an entire crate of concussion grenades underneath a Rancor, knock it out, what could you do that could make money off of this thing? Well, you could kill it and sell parts of it, but you could possibly give it to a crime lord or uh, put it someplace nasty like an imperial base and let it run amok. Uh, space lugs, like the one that almost ate the Millennium Falcon. Uh, Tauntauns, the, uh, the noble creatures that the rebels ride on Hoth. And then we get to general equipment. And general equipment, again, a lot of the things you see, like you see blasters being fired, and you just assume they're like lasers. Blasters aren't really like lasers, though, and this kind of thing explains how the different weapons work. Some of them are obvious, like knives work the same way in science fiction as well as it does in real life, and you can understand they're sharp and they're, they hurt. But vibroblades, how do they work? They work by vibrating thousands of times per second, and that helps... Uh, the edge to cut through things better. Force pikes by creating a force around the blade that uh, allows them to chop through things quite easily. All of those are elements that help to bring your world to life and to help you to kind of understand how this technology might work in your game so that if a circumstance comes up, for example, uh, you want the players to have a shortage of resources, you can just say, well, your blaster gas has gotten flat and uh, your blasts are now firing at half efficiency. So your die codes are all reduced by two, for instance. And that would be enough to get the players interested in getting their guns recharged. 
Um, and that is something that is in the game and is explained in places like this. You also have features of some of the other weapons, maybe not the portable weapons, but you have laser and ion cannons used against speeder class and walker class uh, vessels. And you have a much bigger, more robust list of gear that you can get and equip than the core book had. That's a lifesaver again if you're uh, if you are trying to run a universe where credits matter and people aren't just given their things. And again, more explanation. Personal armor. How it's tough to have personal armor when you have uh, the Empire is trying to keep a lockdown so that you don't have tough soldiers running around in armor that might put up a fight against stormtroopers. These are all things that help to set the universe and they help a game master to run a more realistic world that feels very Star Wars. Um, so yes, this is a brief description of all the different gear that might be useful to Rebels, but not a complete and exha exhaustive list. There's a lot of cracks that you can put in your own details and create to fill needs that will come up in the games. Uh, so, uh, lightsabers. Major part of Star Wars, isn't it? The, the Jedi and their lightsabers. And this explains a little bit about the technology of lightsabers, how they work, and why they're such a central feature. If you don't understand that lightsabers, how they work, what they cut through, this is something to help explain and clear up those kind of uh, questions that might come up, including the technology behind them and the whys and wherefores of them. Now, clearly, of course, the Star Wars universe takes this and goes farther on. This doesn't give options for double-bladed lightsabers or great lightsabers or any of the other odds and ends that come up. Certainly not Kylo Ren's uh, cross-piece lightsaber. But at this point, this was all they had. You only really saw Luke, Obi-Wan, and Vader using them. So those were just standard lightsabers, as much as any lightsaber is standard, and these rules accomplished everything you needed for when your character would have a lightsaber. Stormtroopers, what they are, the different types, because they have specializations. Cold Assault Troops, uh, Zero-G Troopers, Scout Troopers. These were different flavors, and they'd have different gear, and that would be explained. Um, obviously, also, their gear was awfully useful, because players often wanted Stormtrooper armor. It was quite good. Um, and the different varieties could give you, after you've successfully defeated a couple of uh, Imperials, um, a couple of different flavors of armor. Just never get caught with it because it's highly illegal to have anywhere. Um, so if the Imperials see you with it, you are pretty much doomed. Rebel bases. How to set up a rebel base. The different things about them. The important thing is... A rebel base is very seldom going to be exactly like any other base, and this explains it. They're customized to meet the environment that they're found in. They're customized to fill a particular need. Why did the rebels set up the base? Is it for observation? Is it for striking out against the Empire? Is it for storing things? Is it for hiding personnel? Uh, is it for, pr for taking prisoners? Uh, you don't want to uh, have places that uh, prisoners can easily escape out of or that the uh, the Empire can just go find and take easily. So these are all different elements to give you ideas on how to set up bases and a sample base, Tyrfon Rebel Base, which is, uh, it houses a squadron of X-Wings to fly out of it. So this is, uh, again, a, an invaluable tool for a Game Master who is setting their campaign in this universe. Um, and again, this is a description of all the different parts of the outpost so that you can kind of see for yourself how a proper base might be arranged and give you some ideas for your own when you set up different ones for your own stories. Imperial garrisons. Now, the thing is, the Imperial uh, War Machine is very much like a cog. Uh, each, or a uh, it's like a large machine with lots of cogs. Each cog is machined to be the same size so that they're utterly replaceable. So a garrison is going to have a set number of personnel. And you can count on that because it's what the Imperials have decided is the most efficient. And in most cases, they're pretty right. So, for instance, if you come up against this Imperial garrison, you're going to find 800 stormtroopers are going to be stationed there. 
that's a lot of military force in an area. So it's only going to be a couple of places in a system that might have a full imperial garrison. Now there might be you know, imperial garrisons that don't measure up to muster. Maybe they've had some casualties or what have you, indigenous life forms that may have cost them some casualties, but they will try to replenish them up to proper numbers as soon as the empire can get around to doing so through all that massive bureaucracy and everything. But also there may be smaller garrisons that don't quite live up to snuff. And then this would be an imperial base plan. This is something that they would make again and again and again and again because this fits their war machine. Their base is monolithic. It's supposed to look terrifying and imposing. It has a point and a purpose to it. It does have a standard security uh, gate around it, death fence. And the interior is all arranged to maximize efficiency and defensiveness. So, if you are going to go bust an Imperial base, it's uh, good for the storyteller, the game master, to have access to this information. Including things like TIE Fighters, Flight Decks, the interior defenses, and so on. The final chapter, Heroes and Villains, talks about the different characters from the movie. What makes them special, uh, where they come from, in some cases more so than what you really get from the movies, in, in, in many ways. Um, you also have interesting things like this Imperial communi communi com com Communique, uh, which is about what they know about Luke Skywalker and how badly they want to get him. Uh, so if you would, say, find an Imperial data plan where you find that they've sent this out to all uh, moths, say, admirals, generals, and they intercept one of these data slates that has this, they might be able to say, oh, they're looking for Luke Skywalker, this is all the information about him. Even if you've never met him, you could copy this and give this to the players and go, oh, they're looking for this guy. Poor guy, and the entire galaxy looks like they're looking for him. And, of course, you have his statistics. Now, these are, as of the Battle of Yavin, you have their statistics. Obviously, he gets much more powerful as you go. Here he only has 3D in control and 2D in sense. He hasn't gone to Yodi yet, so he doesn't have the ability to alter. But his, oh, let's see, his mechanical skills, his starfighter piloting is 7 dice, his starship gunnery is 6 dice, so he is quite skilled. He is very, very skilled. His blaster skill is 6 dice, which is quite good. Uh, his dodge is 6 dice, which explains how he's still alive. Um, you also see the things that he's not very good at. His con is only a 2D plus 1. He's not good at lying to people. Um, he is, for instance, gambling 2D plus 1. He's not good at it. He's only down to default. He's never really improved it. His bargaining skill is only 3 dice. It's a good thing he wasn't doing negotiations with the Jawas. So you can appreciate that they're built with strengths in mind, but they do have plenty of weaknesses yet. Uh, Princess Leia... Uh, her statistics, again, are mostly going to be <clears throat> awe-inspiring at her uh, knowledge skills. She's going to have eight dice and several skills like bureaucracy and cultures. Uh, and several of her perception skills like command are going to be really high. Again, eight dice. Han Solo, anybody want to make a guess what he's really, really good at? Well, let's go down to mechanical. We're going to look at Starship Gunnery, nine dice. Piloting, 10 dice. Starship shields, even, 60 plus 2. All of his starship things are going to be really, really good. These are going to be top level, what you can expect. A, a real ace, one of the best people in a system, uh, could have skills like this. And even most of them wouldn't have them that high. Now, this is just the core base game. There's no specialties or anything like that. He's just that good. You put him in behind any kind of a starfighter, and he's going to be brilliant. Uh, Chewbacca, again, his strength is 5 dice, but his brawling skills, oh, not much, just 10 dice, uh, stamina 10 dice, so yeah, Chewbacca is really, really good, but he's also got a lot of mechanical skills, he is a worthy, uh, uh, co-pilot to the Millennium Falcon, and his technical skills at repair are quite good, droid programming and repair is all the way up to 7 dice, so, yeah, uh, Starship Repair, 10 dice plus 2. Chewbacca is amazing. And, yeah, this is all Mon Mothma, Lando, 
And then we get to the droids, and unfortunately, that's where the book kind of misses several pages. About eight pages. But that, of course, is going to have Darth Vader, Boba Fett. Um, I don't think they were torn out to be able to make easier reference to them. It's just this was worn out from how often these got used. And again, though, they did give you a really good idea of exactly how good some of these characters were. R2 had some skills that were up in the 9 dice, 10 dice range. C-3PO was that good at alien cultures and languages and had serious flaws in a lot of other things. That's why he was so feeble in so many things. And then finally, the bibliography. This is, again, a really good resource for a person who might be starved for information. <clears throat> who is just getting into the Star Wars universe, wants to tell their own stories, and this is the kind of spackling that you use to fill in cracks in what you know. Even if you're a huge Star Trek fan, this allows you to talk knowledgeably about the technology of Star Wars instead of just kind of hand-waving that and just assuming the players will go along for the adventure. This allows you to make the world feel like Star Wars. So... Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that look. Let's uh, recap this and, and talk a little bit about uh, the impact of this book. So, Star Wars Sourcebook, a very useful tool for a person who is going into the D6 West End game, Star Wars the role-playing game. Obviously, the universe gets established and, and develops far beyond the scope of this relatively simple book. And by the time the second edition rolls out, much of the things that are found in this book are going to be in that source book, the, the, the initial core book. Uh, some of these things are elements that you really might not have wanted to leave behind because the simple details on all the different flavors of TIE fighters, for instance, uh, the different types of star fighters that are available, different levels of stormtroopers that the players are likely to encounter, uh, different aliens, again, the players are likely to encounter. These are all things that really aren't an afterthought. They are a core part of what makes the Star Wars universe feel like a universe that you can wander around in. You expect to see aliens. You expect to see a variety of different technical aspects in Star Wars that you don't find in our world. So instead of having a notebook, you have a data pad. Instead of having um, cleaning staff, you have a cleaning droid. Uh, these things are elements that I sometimes find myself marveling at how these things weren't all in the core book, but I understand it. Obviously, you want to keep selling more and more books, and, and hardcover books made a fair amount of money back in the day. And realistically, I really value this for the explanation on the technology. You have a lot of assumptions going into a Star Wars role-playing game. The assumption that players are going to take without question, why hyperspace? Because you need to get from point A to point B, you can get between different systems. Most people understood this without reading this but explaining how it rips open a, a, a wormhole, basically, and shoves you into it, and that you can encounter other things in hyperspace, that's a little different. Understanding the technical details behind a lightsaber more so than it's a flashlight than when you click it on, it makes a blade that cuts through anything. It's a, little, it's a bit more nuanced than that, quite honestly, and if you've got a Jedi in your group, they may well want to know those kind of details, or how can I make one? What's involved with something like that? And now you have some understanding on the parts that go into it, uh, how that beam is generated and, and holds, holds tight. It's not exhaustive. There are certainly other works that come out that explain it better and more thoroughly, but it's a good thing to start out with so that if you have those kind of questions, they can be answered. I always find in science fiction my hardest thing is, you know, people just throwing themselves out into space without care, uh, assuming that that technology is always going to work. Heck, I don't even trust my car to go out on the road most of the time. And, you know, if it breaks down, that's not going to mean I'm doomed and I'm going to be exposed to hard vacuum. Now, take that into firing yourself up into a rocket into space that doesn't have the ability to, you know, shift and move around where you will. That takes an amazing amount of trust in, in the technology by itself. 
and that's just for a capsule that's going around the Earth that'll eventually come slamming back into the Earth to be hopefully recovered uh, by, uh, you know, near NASA or who have, who have you. But in this case, no, it's just as much of a thought as getting into an airplane, and even more reliably than our airplanes, it seems, uh, to defy gravity, fly off out of the atmosphere, and then enter into hyperspace, launch yourself across the galaxy, and because of these computers that can make navigation possible, find yourself generally where you want to be when you get to the other side, being able to cross the galaxy one side to the other. Mind-boggling in its complexity. If you don't think about it too hard, that's one thing. If you have to tell a story where the players have to deal with the challenges of being in that universe, you want something like this book. You need something like this. When the players ask questions, you want something like this to give you ideas on complications and story elements that can make it feel like they are dealing with the challenges of being in that universe. And, of course, enjoying the benefits. The huge amount of droids that are available, this is just a glimpse, but at least it gives you some ideas on how far you can go and what you can do with something that you can just buy off the shelf. I can buy an astromech droid, and it's got this. But you know that it can do so much more. And now you can start using those droid programming and repair roles to start tinkering and upgrading and making this servant a friend and a useful tool. Uh, some of the gear in there, again, explaining out some of what you see in the movies is great, but you have to understand the movies are just a slice of the universe. There's so much more. And this book starts to hint at what is possible outside of that scope. Now, clearly, as I said, this book gets obviated eventually. There are plenty of other books out there that explain those things in greater detail and give you much greater range of selections. But most of those, most of the chapters in this book, take an entire book to elaborate on in greater detail down the road. When we get to the Imperial Source book, for instance, all the things about garrisons and bases and that, that's all going to be covered in there as well. Uh, when it comes to lightsabers and that, there's going to be books about using the Force that will also have details on how to make your own lightsabers and the technology. But, if all you had was the core book, and then you add this to it, you drastically expand it on what you can bring before your players to make your Star Wars universe feel like the Star Wars universe they've experienced on the big screen. So, um, if you are going to go back and you are going to go old school, first edition, uh, I would strongly, rec strongly recommend the source book. Again, lots of good details. And it's a fun book to look at and read, too. There's the interesting little stories and things that are that, 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 that bring, make it feel a little bit more alive. But uh, as you go down the road, if you get into second edition, uh, this isn't nearly as necessary. It's still a good read. It's still a good read. But uh, eventually, as I said, everything that's in here gets covered as more and more materials become available. So, still an important part of history, though, which is why we should preserve it, and it is thusly recorded here for the society. So, thank you for um, watching this consideration. I hope that you've enjoyed this walk back in time, and join us for more, because there's certainly plenty more materials in the Star Wars universe for Star Wars, the role-playing game. Thank you, and until next time, may the Force be with you.